Hi, I would like to say hi to all. And first of all, I don't know how to do a JSX graph applet. I have no idea how to do it. I don't understand the messages that you sent to each other in the Moodle stating about uh, just make a block in Python. So Alfred told me that it would be interesting to all of you to hear something about um, how to use these applets in the frameworks of video lectures from social science perspective. And in the second half, uh, Martin will talk about what you know and what you appreciate, but let us start with, let me just share the screen, okay. Do you see something? Yeah, you see it. Yes. Yeah. So Martin and I and a larger group of uh, colleagues is working. But Alenka, Alenka, sorry, but we see the, the presentation mode, not your presentation. Ah. You shared okay. the wrong screen. I, I sh am sharing the wrong screen. Now it's right. Now it's okay. Okay. So Martin, uh, myself, Andreas, and a lot of uh, colleagues are working in this project that is hard technical. So Jorge, who know how to machine translate things, Alfred, Martin, and those who know how to do JSX graphs, and some of us that believe that know something about the theoretical aspect of teaching. In practical aspect of teaching, Martin is still better. Uh, so this is this expert project. And uh, video pedagogy is uh, something that was quite uh, embraced by the teaching uh, population when the COVID closed the schools. So the flipped learning approach was something that a lot of teachers used. Uh, they sent to students some materials, often those were uh, uh, videos or also written works and then the students first learned by themselves and when they got back to classrooms or those were not physical classrooms those were uh, zoom meetings they were doing some more challenging exercises uh, and that is what is video pedagogy actually about uh, and flipped learning is only one approach how to use video in teaching. It was quite research, this flipped learning with pre-prepared videos. And uh, the research somehow suggests that it is quite good for STEM, for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics teaching and learning uh, in primary and in secondary school. But the effect to knowledge is small. We see more positive uh, effect in the autonomous learning, what is logical, because they have to learn by themselves, they have to organize time, they have to make small uh, steps in order to gain the knowledge. And in Slovenia, when Corona started, we believe that we know a lot about e-learning or distance learning. We had some materials and some organizations worked in e-learning, but when the schools closed, actually we had this emergency e-teaching and learning, everything fell apart. Teachers didn't know what to do. They sent students only written instructions. In mathematics, it is, it, the instructions were read the first page in textbooks and then do exercises 5 to 17. And of course, that was not a good approach for students. When we asked quite a lot of teachers in Slovenia after the second year, how were they working? We saw that they split approximately in third. One third of the teachers tried to manage this emergency teaching and learning as they should. 
they were sending video lectures, they were recording videos, uh, they were doing video conferences and working with children together. The second third were sending only written instructions and they had Zoom meetings with children trying to teach them. But the third still sent only written uh, instructions. And now our studies show that the knowledge of the children in primary and in secondary school fell around 10 to 20% regarding which subject do you take. So video pedagogy is something that is researched, is acknowledged as promising approach, but when we come to practice, it doesn't work. And actually it doesn't know work good because we don't have a lot of video lectures. And we also don't know when a video lecture is a good one. Uh, in literature, we can find a lot of characteristics of a good video lecture. But the literature is very inconsistent. You will find an empirical research that says that something is good and the one that says that something is not good. Uh, then there are a lot of characteristics. I believe that we found more than 50 of them. They are unrelated. Some of them are more technical and some of them are more pedagogical. For pedagogical ones, you don't know what is the benefit uh, in technical part. For technical part, you don't know what is the benefit in pedagogical part. And almost all research is done at university level. And of course, we want to use video lectures also in the primary and secondary school. One of the characteristics is how the video lecture should be recorded if you record something that is um, that has physical objects and manipulating physical objects. This characteristic is, characteristic is quite logical. You should uh, record from the first perspective in order to allow children to see the bigger picture and so that the hands are not in the way. It seems logical, but still, we have a research that says, yes, first perspective is better, and we have research that says, no, the, the second perspective is better. And they argue that the second perspective is better because that is how a student see a teacher working. If you are demonstrating something, the student cannot stand behind your back and look at your hands. He is normally looking from this side of the table. So we try to analyze and group all these characteristics in some basic characteristic that we agreed upon that says something about what a good video lecture is. And so we got seven basic principles. The first one is instruction. If the teaching method is not good, the video could be recorded excellent, uh, the applets could be wonderful, everything that you can do can be excellent, but if you teach adding fractions, add above and add below, that won't be good. So the instruction is the basic. Then the visibility of the teacher is something that we are not so sure about, whether the teacher should be visible on a lecture. There are several recording formats. The most usual is voiceover, that meaning showing some slides, and the voice is explaining what is on the slides. Then the second one is picture in picture. You see a lecture in a small square or in a small circle explaining what is happening on. The third one is live capture when you use a transparent board or you use some editing of the video after the video was recorded and you see the whole lecture that is interacting 
with whatever is he explaining, writing on the board. Well, we have discussed quite a lot. Uh, what does it mean for a student if the student sees a teacher that is not his own teacher? Of course, Martin students are happy to see Malti, but I don't know how would my students react on seeing Malti. But for now, the research is more on the side that it is good to see a teacher, at least hands of a teacher. So those were first two principles, instruction and visibility. Then we have the next part of the principle, segmentation, activity, interactivity, and dynamic drawing. Segmentation is connected to the length of the video. Uh, research showed that uh, university students were able to look at uh, educational video for six minutes. Half of them could last nine minutes. After nine minutes, all university students couldn't follow the video lecture anymore. So uh, segmentation, splitting the video in parts and saying in some parts, now you have to do that or asking some questions is already connected to the activity and interactivity. When you stop on a bookmark, you can ask the student uh, some questions and they answer and you can also give a feedback or the student can also have integrated applet or stack questions. What is, of course, better if they are integrating, integrated, the student is interacted in interactivity mode with the video. And the dynamic drawing is something similar. We can have a simple version where the lecturer is drawing and writing on the board. But we, of course, can have some dynamic geometry tool where a, ch a child could also draw some geometry objects. So H5P allows a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities in these bookmarks. And of course, multiple choice questions are not so good as integrated questions or applets. Then we have the last principle that is actually connected with the uh, aim of the project. We have named it translatability. translatability. Uh, our project wants to use the video lectures in national languages as a source for machine translating. That is something that Jorge has been talking about. But the video lecture that is then machine translated should be designed in a specific way. If we look at the above uh, video lecture or print screen of a video lecture, we see that we still can guess what is saying about the seven, what is saying about the two, three, and one. It is the basic division theorem, and of course, those are the names. In the below video, we don't have any national words. We only have dynamic arrows. When the lecturer is saying uh, square root, the dynamic arrow, the, the blue one, shows the square root and so on. And of course, this one below is easily translatable than the video above. But if you think about uh, our slides or what we write on the blackboard, it is filled with text. Even though we are mathematicians, we write quite a big portion of text. And if you want the video to be translated in English and then into other languages, you should really think about what words would you use, because they cannot translate a word in a picture. They cannot take the word out of the picture and translate it. They can translate the text and they can translate the sound, but they cannot translate the text inside of a picture. 
So those are seven principles that we believe that are quite fundamental. But that is not enough for the taxonomy. In pedagogy, we have this famous Bloom taxonomy uh, that starts with remembering, goes on with understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So you cannot understand if you haven't remembered some basic rules. You cannot apply the knowledge that you haven't understood. You cannot analyze the knowledge that you haven't applied. You cannot evaluate the knowledge that you haven't analyzed. And at the end, you cannot create if you haven't reached all taxonomic levels below. That is like in theory. And we wanted to build something similar for the video lectures. So we took our seven basic principles and discussed which one is the basic. And of course, the basic is instruction, the method of teaching followed by visibility, segmentation, activity, interactivity, dynamic drawing, and translatability. It could happen that we will shift something, but for now the whole group is satisfied with this order. And then we wanted also to give a teacher some tool. If the teacher has a video, how can he know on which taxonomic level this video is. Therefore, we formed like descriptors for each of the principles from non-acceptable to excellent quality. In each of those cells, we wrote the descriptor. For instance, we have here some video that we evaluated together. This video uh, is uh, on visibility picture in picture, what means high quality uh, in uh, instruction, it's medium quality because it lacks some parts of, from the list how the teaching is good. Then uh, there are bookmarks in the timeline and mandatory policies, but there are no uh, pop-up questions. That is why it is medium quality on C. We have some possible activities embedded as text in the video and lecture says, see, that is the activity, pause the video and do that. What could be high quality for D? And we have pre-test and evaluation test for E. And on F, that is dynamic drawing, those D, E, and F are connected. Activity, interactivity, and dynamic drawing are quite connected and we have on some parts that students are using dynamic visualization tools. And in the translatability part, uh, there are some names written, but there are only names for concept or at least not a lot of text. That is meaning minimal. And then we gave points. Minimal is one point, medium two, and excellent four. And we see that, that this video is on taxonomy F, that is quite high, and has reached 19 points. But we also were talking about what happens if a video is not acceptable in some lower taxonomic levels. For instance, a video could be long, longer than five minutes for student age between 11 and 14, what we agreed that it is like a minimum. And again, that is a lower taxonomic level, what means that D, E, F, and G actually doesn't count because it is too long, it is not segmented, it doesn't help that could be translated. So such a video, it is an imaginary video, we haven't uh, did it. This video would get uh, for the first X, two points, then three points, and then there are zero points, and we don't add any other points, so it would have only five uh, points uh, on taxonomy level B. So we hope that with all these tools and with examples that we will provide, we will help, help teachers to choose a good video for their students. But in my personal opinion, teachers will not be able to create all that video because it is technically 
quite hard. So somebody has to provide the video for them. And I am talking now about an average teacher. Of course, Martin is high, high above the average, and Martin will be the one that is providing the video lectures for all teachers. And uh, Jorge will allow that Martin's German will be translated to Slovenian, and also Slovenian teachers could use Martin's video. So that is my part. Please, Martin, now. We have okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon from me to all of you. Um, no, stop sharing first. And I start sharing now. I can't share it while you are sharing. <laughs> I'm not okay. Oh, thanks. It's yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm blurred a bit. I see it in the camera picture. Hi. Good afternoon from me. Um, I will now try to share my screen. I hope it works. Do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, Hi, I'm greeting you from Tirschenreuth. We are in the northern part of Bavaria, not far away from Bayreuth. Um, and we are working together in this expert project with um, Alfred and Carsten and uh, the whole chair of the Technics of Mathematics. And well, we are a school and we are trying to make all this happen and, and try out <laughs> um, all the contents that we are creating. So I'm at the Stiftland Gymnasium Tirschenreuth and I want to put in to his perspective what, what Alenka just said. So it's really hard for us teachers to get really good content and to produce the content, it's it's even harder. So there's the idea that we have a common basic system, a common uh, system maybe in the whole country. So in, in Bavaria, it's the Bayern Cloud Schule now. So we have one centralized system where all the contents is coming together. We have about 2 million um, students um, inscribed in our uh, Moodle platform that is integrated in this uh, central cloud system. And uh, every teacher has a lot of courses in there and, uh, and the students have access. And let's not the only thing about it, uh, additionally, there is a, a platform called TeachShare. It's also integrated and it um, enables us to share content. So if any teacher like Matthias or Sandra created some content, they can share it with all the teachers in Bavaria at an instant. And of course, the main question for all the teachers is always, how do I find good content fast? And how can I see whether it's good or not? So you can see here, there is some kind of quality rating system in this platform integrated. So we have this five-star system like in Amazon and our video taxonomy system now from uh, the expert project will provide something similar for videos. But because we need it, we are, we are needing good co digital content for having a digital education, um, the content has to be packaged. It has to be simple. So one package system is for sure a Moodle course. I can easily recreate a Moodle course in my own Moodle system. Another possibility is something like H5P. I think most of you will know it. So we now, now Elenka talked a lot of, of about the videos and uh, there were aspects like segmentation or interactivity of the video. So I want to show you an example now from physics. It's a video about, oh, it doesn't load, <laughs> I have to reload. Um, it's a video about uh, uh, convex lenses. Uh, uh, so, and yes, and it's already packaged here with H5P. So I can watch the video. I have, um, I have subtitles. I can switch the subtitles, of course, off. Um, and it's even possible to have the video in different languages and qualities available. So I have made this video and I'm, I recreated uh, two versions of it. So there's already a translated one. The segmentation means that I have some bookmarks in the video. So um, a student can easily jump to a special point in the video. And uh, you can see here the dynamic drawing principle that Alenka talked about. So it helps the student to see how drawings uh, are developed and how um, how uh, yeah, things are put together, <laughs> actually, uh, here um, yeah, in geometry. So um, interactivity means that we have exercises in the video that can be done 
in the video without leaving it. And this enables uh, to have some, uh, to, to not having, having uh, students drift away while they are watching the video. Alenka just said um, six minutes or above are really hard even for university students. Um, we, have, we, we recognize that uh, students in eighth or ninth grade don't are not able to, to last uh, with their attention in this video for more than three minutes. So we have to have a lot of interactions in the video, pausing the video, and that they have to reflect what they just uh, have seen and um, they, they can yeah, do something with it. So um, H5P enables us to have, a, have this packaged altogether different subtitles. Uh, the segmentation is in there and we have maybe different uh, even different languages available. We were showing these kind of videos to our students and ask them to give them to give us feedback. So we were trying to have some evaluation for it, of course. And I can show you some evaluation here from one of our groups. Um, and we ask them how they estimate that they have had a gain of knowledge uh, by watching the video. And this, most of the time, this comes out very good. So the students really appreciate to have good content. And the thing about videos is that you can use the content in the classroom. You can use it um, reflecting what the, what the students just learned in the classroom at home. You can use it in a flipped uh, um, environment. So the students watch the video, come into the class, and they have already some pre-knowledge again by the video. Or you can use it in distance learning. Um, like in emergency remote teaching. So where, now where comes JSX graph into play, <laughs> you, may, you may ask. So I have an example for that, of course. Um, I already said that it's uh, quite practical for our teach for us teachers to have the content packed together. So we want to have maybe a video or some instruction. We want to have exercises. And we, of course, we want to have a good visualization that is interactive. And in this last part, JSX graph can play, I think, an important role. Um, most of my, of my mathematics colleagues and uh, teachers are now at the moment use Ge GeoGrippa to visualize uh, mathematical contents. Um, but maybe there is a perspective that we can easily, more easily add JSX graph into these H5P packages when at the moment it's possible with GeoGebra. So here's an example for stochastic independence. Well, the video now, you see translatability is not realized because I, I, this is handwritten. This cannot be automatically translated. But here in this video, I have, again, two different uh, voiceovers, one in German, one in English. The video is rather short. This is a very short instruction what, the, what a stochastic independence really is. So it is shown how it's defined. And then I want in the end have, have a simple exercise and a solution video for the exercise where again the solution video is segmented and I can uh, as a student try to solve the problem for myself and then can reflect whether I did it the same way the teacher would have done it. So this is the so-called interactive book um, element of H5P. And I have been trying to integrate now the visualization I just showed you here um, for the family of Bayes to have the um, conditional probability, or to have a visualization of conditional probability, actually. Um, um, and it has already worked in some time, but that's the problem now we're facing again and again. Even if we have at one point a, a content of good quality, maybe something in the, in the technical parts change and the content that once worked is not working anymore. And this is, yeah, this is a, a killer often because if I show something like this to my teacher colleagues and they use it, they want to try it themselves and they face some errors, they're off. Yeah, they say, no, it doesn't work. I can't use it. Um, so what, what did I do here? Um, I know there is already a, an H5P um, element of JSX graph. Uh, but I, it's not working yet with the interactive book. That would be my wish to the developers now. Um, well, yes, but, but what I did was um, I used 
um, the H5P element called iframe embedder. And I was trying to just embed the already working um, HTML file, which included the um, JSX graph visualization you see here. But some, somehow this embedding system doesn't work. I get uh, um, JavaScript errors. And I don't know how to solve it. <laughs> Maybe later on, Andreas can help me. Maybe I, I'm, I'm, it's my fault because I was using a very old version, 1.2.3. OK, so I think this, this could be a very good way to have high quality content, not only having a video with good video uh, taxonomy, but um, let me see, where was it? But having um, everything integrated in actually just one file that can easily be reused. Because even if I don't use Moodle and don't use the uh, Moodle courses as, as a content packaging system, I can more easily reuse H5P files. I can just download the file everywhere. I can play H5P files. And it's not limited to Moodle, uh, but can also be used with Drupal or other uh, content management systems. Okay, so that's the view from the teacher's point of view, I think. Um, the students um, are very happy um, if they are able to use, or if, they are if their teachers uh, want them to use digital content that has a high quality, um, maybe it will, um, yeah, it, I hope so, <laughs> that it will be possible that we can integrate all the different technologies that are out there in packaging formats that can easily be given from one teacher to another. Thank you.